care what anybody says. You all suck at accountability. You can lie to yourselves <laughs> all you want about your money, but most people suck at accountability. They either go too hard in it or yeah. they go too soft in it. And a lot of people get lost in saving the world before they've done anything in the world. Do something in the world that makes you great and turn a profit at it. What a lot of people lack is just perspective. We villainize success and we villainize it for one of two reasons. We villainize it because we don't have it. And so it becomes something that we look at negatively or we villainize it because we have no perspective of how to get it. On today's show, we talk about building real wealth and creating a rich life with the money man for millionaires, Scott Danner. I want you to help me overcome a bias and a challenge I have. Like, help me understand what a good financial advisor knows that the general public doesn't about money and about wealth generation, aside from them trying to get a commission, aside from them trying to push the product. It's the simplest answer in the world. It's not complicated. Number one, a lot of a lot of things can be perceived as bull. If you think that you can do something that somebody else can do better. Uh oh, then, that's that's a big problem I have because I think I'm good at everything. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. That's the engineering mindset. And I love people that think that way because I'm completely different. But I also mm. watched your 90 day journey on health and I noticed that you had a functional medicine doctor, you had a, uh, a personal trainer, you had an entire team and network to help you achieve your goals and to make sure you stayed on task. And here's what we know that most people don't acknowledge. That is that most of us are self-destructive, especially when it comes to money. And we tell ourselves whatever we wanna hear. And the reality is, as a financial advisor and someone that's been doing this for two decades, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant, I'm a friend, I'm an accountability partner. I'm somebody that's here to help you achieve what it is you're aiming for. And if you don't feel the value exists, then you don't work with me anymore. It's just like working with any coach or anybody in your life. But being a financial coach for two decades and knowing that it's bigger than just picking the best companies. like, And you also have to remember, Mark, this. And, and um, our industry was shaped by the old days, okay? So I was trained by all these guys, and it was all guys, first of all, but all these guys that, were, that, that grew up in the 1980s and just sold stuff. So they did, they just sold stuff. And guess what? In 2002, when I was starting in this industry, after the 1999 you know, downturn, after September 11th, I come right into this industry. And the reality of that is I learned this quick, about 30 seconds in, that if I sold stuff, I wouldn't be in business very long. And that's why there are more 80-year-old advisors in my industry today than there are 30 and 40-year-olds. Because everybody that did what they were told to do and didn't change and, 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 and morph into the industry's better half, the better version of themselves, which was consulting, coaching, guiding, helping people. Because I can tell you this, I've worked in this industry for 20 years and I hear a lot of crap and I, I deal with a lot of uh, advisors sometimes that I don't really believe that they're doing anything but selling me something. But I deal with a lot of them that are really great humans and have been great coaches to their clients for many, many years. And that extra bit of accountability has made each of those individuals better. So what, what do they know, though, that we don't? I mean, the coach is great, so we've, we've set up the, the reason for having that because you're right. I mean, when I did my Chunk Tong Challenge, uh, more more than their knowledge, I needed their accountability because you're right. I am the king of self sabotage. <laughs> yeah. Like like we're recording this at a time where I have not been on my diet. I have not exercised. I'm looking at myself and I'm like, my goodness, I'm looking puffy. So I need to get back at it and I need that accountability. And so I can understand why you know an advisor or, or anyone who knows what they're doing provides that for you. But what do they know or understand that that we don't? Yeah, well, I think there's two parts to that. Okay, let's, first of all, professionally, anybody that spends all their time and all their energy in one area 
is going to have a little better understanding than the average individual that's that's hiring them to do the job. It, again, no different than a personal trainer. Forget the accountability part. That's the second part. But the first part is professionally, they're studying something that, yeah, you can study on your own and you can dedicate a lot of time and energy into that field. And if you want to do that for your life, then, then I think that a lot of people are financially successful. I work with a lot of people um, that will come in and they'll start off the conversation by telling me everything that they've ever done that's successful in the financial space. And there's been many a times that I've told that individual, Mark, you are not going to be a great client for us. And you have a lot of this stuff figured out in the areas that you need yourself to be most successful. But it's it's our job to help you. We only take on people that we think we can help and guide. And so if that individual thinks they know more or has known more, or maybe they're an expert in real estate and that's how they've made all their money. And it's very difficult to convert someone to an area that's completely different or unique. You know, one of my best friends is so successful in real estate. I love him to death. Every time we start talking about diversification, you know, I buy real estate all the time. I believe in diversification, but he does not believe the same way I believe that it's important to have a lot of different things. I won't say that any one person knows more than another one person because I don't know the two people we're talking about. So it's really hard for me to answer that question directly. I'm trying yeah. to do it the best that I can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The second part to that is, I don't care what anybody says, you all suck at accountability. You can lie to <laughs> yourselves all you want about your money, but most people suck at accountability. They either go too hard in it or yeah. they go too soft in it. And so the people that are great at it, I was talking with a family member this past weekend, you'll appreciate this, probably one of the smartest money people I've ever known in my life. All right. Extremely successful, retired in their thirties, you know, amazing individual built it all through investing traditional stocks and, and bonds and, and investments. Okay. Super smart. And they were talking about moving and how they could sell the, the family home and potentially move to um, a second home. And if they stayed in that home for a set amount of years, then the tax implications would be very, very small. Then they would move into their, their retirement home. And I simply said, I had the, the, the wife talking emotion and telling me how it was hard to leave. And I had the smart human who I know very, very well and admire and have learned so much from telling me how, but logically this makes yeah. the most sense. And guess what my job was to do? My job was to balance the two of them out. My job was to acknowledge and empathize with the emotion that goes with this decision and also say, dude, sometimes the right decision doesn't make you happy. You can be right or you can be happy, but you can't often be both. Which one would you rather be? And he said, I'd rather be happy. And I said, then you're not going into the second home and I don't give a damn about the taxes. Right, right, right. Is that a that fair? Sounds, so, it sounds like every, it sounds like every man in his fifties and sixties and maybe even seventies that I've ever met in my life, you know, my father-in-law decides, uh, um, you know, and, and I love him, but he decides mid pandemic that that would be the perfect time to sell their home, to buy an RV because the world will open up six months later. Well, that didn't happen. Now they're living in my brother-in-law's basement because they have nowhere to live, but, uh, it, but it all makes financial sense. <laughs> yeah. Logic gets in the way sometimes of reality and knowing too much can paralyze you. It can make you focus strictly on the most important things. We have clients that that are that have net worths of, of 30 to $50 million, dude, they've got it all figured out. But what we do for them is organize all that thought, all that okay. logic, all those facts. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, sometimes we're just, we're just a second ear to make sure we guide them through the estate planning process. You know, they, that's a really challenging part. And when you have a coach or a quarterback or someone that's not the lawyer, sitting down with you and being your advocate, you're on the same side of the table. These are all things that we do that don't, that people don't often know that we're doing, especially with, with, with significantly high net worth individuals. And so, you know, 
I also help people give money to their kids and, and make good decisions that aren't, that they just can't logically get their, their arms around. Like a client the other day said they wanted to talk about, um, they wanted to give a gift to their kids, but they wanted it to be with parameters. Mm -hmm. All I did was reframe the words that they were going to say not what they wanted to do. So they want to give it to the children and they want them to buy a home with it. And I said, well, what if they don't want to buy a home with it? And he said, I don't care. I want them to use it for something good. And then he went on to say, I'd really like to know what their financial uh, situation is and whether or not they're spending their money right. And I was like, look, man, you have to <laughs> give without expectation. If you're giving, it's yeah. giving without expectation. That is a crucial part of a gift. So I said, what if you said, I really would love to help you buy a home. I've got some money set aside. Would you be open to looking at that? That's a reframing. That, yeah. that person is going to be a lot more interested in having that conversation. Man, I'm not saying that I know more than you as a, as a financial advisor, but I know how to talk better when it comes to money than a lot of other people. And that's something that helps families stay together it helps parents not alienate themselves as they get older and a little bit more, you know, stringent on discipline and the things they do as they get older, especially if they are financially stable and their kids aren't as financially stable. You, you're actually you're actually bringing me around, man, because, um, you know, obviously uh, there's a great podcast, Death, Sex and Money and, and uh, from NPR. And the reason that they focus on that is those are the three main taboo subjects, right? You know, no one's going to talk about it. We're not going to bring it on the open. But but just the just being good even even having the skill set of being comfortable and being good helping people through those conversations i can i can see the value in that now you've mentioned a few things and i always bump up against this uh, i've spent most of my life around high net worth individuals as they say within the financial world and and i have found that there are there are certain types of people there are people who um, are down and out or they they've they've grown up in 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 not ideal circumstances but they have that hunger and they have that drive and they have the desire for more. But they got to get started. They got to get over that hurdle. They want more, but they're but but there's so many things stacked against them. Then there are people, and I would put myself in this middle category, who have been surrounded by these types of people. Yet I don't have it, but but I know it's achievable. I know it's comfortable. I feel like I just have to set up a few key dominoes, and and then, tada, it will happen. And then there are the people who are already there. And what I find is most people spend a lot of time focused on those who are already there. I'm going to help successful people become slightly more successful, right? But the people in the middle like me, we just need to figure some things out and we'll have it. And But the people who are what I'll call down and out are the people who, who have that drive and have that desire, but, but they have to get over that massive hurdle. How do they do that? Like, where do they start? What do they start with? Because you can be a six-figure earning middle-class person in your 40s, but still be just as stuck with that hurdle as the 19-year-old who's, who's, who's sleeping on a, you know, a, a whatever, a sofa somewhere because they have nothing. Both yeah. of them have to get out of, of the trap. They have to get un, out of the hole to be, then be able to do the things they need to do. I still, when you started describing them, I almost considered myself still in the first phase. And I'm really? actually in, in some circles, I am definitely in the last phase, but I never feel like I've, I've gotten there, which goes right to the, we do hard things and the things that you talk about all the time. I think that surrounding yourself, and I talk about this in the book, but the circle of which you surround yourself with eventually will rub off on you. And anybody that's surrounding themselves with people that are at a different stage of life, which I've always done. And sometimes it makes you, um, it makes you aware that there is a different level of life out there. I always tell a funny story. I'm, I'm in a, a, an awesome group called Genius Network with Joe Polish. And I happen to be in the bathroom with one of our speakers. I won't use the person's name. And, and they were going out of a major airport. And I, I was like, well, at least there's direct flights out of those airports. And he was like, well, I, I flew my private jet in. And, uh, and I, I, in the moment, you know, I could have chosen to feel this big. 
But I mean, I didn't, I was just naive. I didn't think about it. I was like, oh yeah, people do that. I've got other people that are worth just as much as this guy that fly commercial every day and refuse to even fly first class because they won't spend the money. You know, there's, there's so many people. I think you brought me around in the sense that it's about defining your freedom. What specifically does living richly mean to you? What exactly is that? Because you could be in the middle of that, or you could be at the beginning of that, or you could be at the end and not have any figured out. Like, I don't care how much money you have. If you're not living a rich life, you don't have it figured out. If your kids hate you and you're full of money, who cares? I mean, these are some of the things that- What I if think, your kids hate you and you have no money? I mean, then you're really screwed, right? Yeah, but at least they have. At least there's a reason. You know, okay. I mean, a lot of times, at least there's a reason. The, the, the reason isn't, I, I'm not giving you any attention. I'm choosing to put work first. I'm choosing to put money first. The answer is I'm doing the best that I can and I'm failing, but I love you. Like there is a, it, the, let me tell you what, not having money sometimes is way easier parenting than having it. And in, in, in two decades of, of coaching and teaching people this, and then having two different worlds, because I came from no money, meaning that when I asked my mom and dad for something in the store, the answer was no, and I understood why. When my kids grew up asking me if they could have something in the store, I say no, and they don't understand the, the reason why. And they're right, because I can afford it most of the time. I'm choosing to say no, not to spoil them, not to enable them, not to make them into monsters, you know? <laughs> You know, that that's, that's what I, cause that's what I've seen in my industry so often. Right. So, but it, no, when mom said no, when I was a kid, I didn't like it, but I understood it. There's some peace in that. Have you ever given your friends advice, Mark, on, on marriage? You've been married how long? Uh, 16 years. Okay. Yeah, usually, have, usually they don't uh, ask for it. I just, I just volunteer it. <laughs> and you have four kids between the ages of four and 13 or, or somewhere six and 13. Yeah, uh, almost eight and 15, yeah. Okay, eight and 15. So I have a yeah. 12 and a 15-year-old. Every time somebody talks about marriage and they're new or they're learning, I have advice for them. You have advice for them. Well, imagine part of that is because you're in a full-time research project every day of living a married man's life. You can't say what it's like to be a married woman. You can't say what it's like to be in a partnership of, of a different type. You can't say, but you could say what it's like to be married to a woman as a man and your perspective. It's what you've seen and know. It's, I always call it like a full-time research project. Like I've learned so much that I didn't know in my life that now I can share with other people, right? Same thing with us, except we do it in money. So it's this full time, everything's money, all the conversations. Like we have to reframe people's logic and minds sometimes to talk about what really matters to them and get off the money because you can't help anybody if all they're coming to you for is to talk about money. So when everything is money driven, you true authenticity in the beginning is really diving deep into understanding the actual stuff around money and finances. But really finding that next level of success comes from exactly what every business comes from, building great relationships and understanding and empathizing with the other human across the desk from you. That's how you have great relationships. That's how you have great businesses. And to me, that's what the business changed to. And so a lot of my goals were money driven in the beginning. It was, Hey, hit this goal. And you hit this make a hundred thousand dollars. It was a, called the century award. Like I was like, Oh man, if I could just do that before I, I turn 30, I I've done great. Like I had small goals for myself. Like they're small today, but they were huge back then when I started. I mean, when I left the government, um, my mom, my mom and dad, but my mom especially told me that I shouldn't leave, that I was leaving a government pension, that I was leaving a, a steady job that would always be there. And I earned more than both of them individually were earning at the time. And my mom said that it was probably not a smart idea for me to leave that safety. And, yeah. um, and I, I remember being in this, I'm just not afraid of a little bit of risk and I'm not afraid to bet on myself. And I wasn't afraid to say, nope, I'm going to do something different. 
And uh, three years later, we were sitting at at a five star resort in Mexico. I took my mom, and we're sitting at lunch. And I said, "When you told me that, I really struggled because I I believed you, and I believed everything you were saying, but I just knew something was better out there, and I had to find it." And I want you to look at our experience over the next five to seven days. I want you to see what it's like to order whatever you want to your room. I want you to feel what you deserve because you're a special person in my life. And you made me, you helped create me, and I can show you these things. That wasn't what money, it wasn't about the money. It was what money could do for our relationship. It was how we could do different things. And I could show my mom things she had never seen in her life. Like that's what drove me. Yeah, I I love that. You know, you know, I, I mentioned that I've I've been around what people call high net worth individuals, and my grandparents did very well for themselves. They they my grandfather moved from Germany to Canada in 1950. He started as a as a stonemason. They they hustled. Ten years later, they're a developer. Um, by by the early 2000s, a privately held company, but roughly 500 million dollars in 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 business and assets. So they were able to grow it over 60 70 years. Um, there was a point where my grandparents started taking our entire family on family trips. And for their anniversary, for the 50th anniversary, their 55th, their 60th, there was a time where, where my grandmother turned to my mom and said, oh, we're spending like, I don't remember what it was, we're spending $15,000 a day to have the family here on this trip. And she's like, and my grandmother went, money well spent. And then a year and a half later, she passed. And that was it. But it always stuck with me where I was like, my fifteen thousand dollars a day that that they're spending to have us here. I'm like, oh, that's so much money, and is it worth it? And couldn't they live in it? It's like all of these rational things. But now that I'm the age I'm at, and I could look back at that, I'm like, my goodness, I I I hope and wish and dream that one day that not only will I be comfortable spending that kind of money to have just my family with me on the beach, you know, in Jamaica for a bunch of days. Um, I I think looking back, my grandfather and grandmother would have spent any amount of money to be able to have that time with us. Because at a certain point, money stops mattering. Mattering? Mattering is not a word. It stops, it it, it becomes not important anymore because all you want is that time. With the people that you work with, the successful people you work with that, that have obviously been able to make this transition, how did that transition come in your experience? How were they able to arrive at that? Because you need money, and then when you have it, you don't suddenly, right? You want time, you want connections, you want relationships. Is there a way we could speed that up? So first of all, anybody that's chasing money and continues to chase money never catches it. Mm-hmm. So the people like your grandparents were never chasing money. They were chasing experiences. They were chasing relationships. They were chasing love. Successful people, money comes to those people who realize, I love this, Zig Ziglar said, there are three things that if you just do these three things, everybody will find success. And this person was telling the story about chasing money and how unsuccessful they were because they couldn't, you know, every month it was like paying these bills and then it was this and they couldn't, every time something good would happen, something bad would happen and they would, they just couldn't get ahead. And Zig said, you really only need three things. Number one, you need to help people. If you help people and you serve people, it's extremely valuable, but that's the baseline of any business. Number two is you have to turn a profit. There's a concept nowadays where everybody comes out of college and they want to work for the nonprofits and nonprofits (laughs) don't have tons of money and you have tons of resources and opportunity and a lot of people get lost in saving the world before they've done anything in the world. Do something in the world that makes you great and and turn a profit at it. And when you turn a profit at it, it becomes quite valuable. So you're helping people, number one. Number two, you're turning a profit. Number three, you're serving something bigger than yourself. In my instance, it's God. When there's something above you, something that's bigger than you, it's not your ego. It, there's there's no, you, you're, you're figuring out how to give the world what you've learned. You're sharing it. It's why I do these podcasts. It's why we do these things is to bring this logic and this mindset to the world to make the world a little bit better, to change just a little bit. One person listening could be the difference maker. And and so the reason I, I say that is because I think that, you know, th- your your grandparents had success, 
but there's no way they got to that level of success by being giant jerks and money hungry. <laughs> and it's just not, but we villainize success and we villainize it for one of two reasons. We villainize it because we don't have it. And so it becomes something that we look at negatively or we villainize it because we have no perspective of how to get it. And so our job is to help people find ways to get it. And those people that you asked and referenced are most successful when the money doesn't matter at all. They don't give a damn about the money. The money is, they're not watching. They're not Ebenezer Scrooge watching their stocks go up or down every single day, counting money every single day. They actually are just watching what money can do in their lives to help the people around them. And they're bringing every damn person they can with them. That's what those good people are doing. That's what your grandparents obviously were doing. I love that. I, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it that way before. Um, now, the, the Ziegler quote is, is interesting to me, right? The idea that you need to be able to do something that helps people. You need to be able to turn a profit so that way you can have access to cash and reinvest it and it makes sense that way and then serve the bigger purpose. How, and again, we're speaking, we're speaking philosophically as opposed to tactically because you don't know the case in front of you. But most of the time, we, will, we, we struggle to take ourselves out of everyday life to free up the space, the time, the resources, what we need to go out and serve people. <clears throat> you know, if I'm working a minimum wage job or two jobs, I don't have time or energy to go out and serve people. I mean, we call it the side hustle and, and all of that yeah. stuff. But, but how do we stop doing the things that we can't be doing to free up space for the things we should be doing so that way we can serve people, so that way we can generate a profit? So, like, like y again, you need that, like, kickstart. You need, you need yeah. that, that coverage, you know, what's really funny, Mark, I, I get in these, um, you know, uh, I have family members that will tell me that, that my kids, um, don't understand work ethic and they want them to come out and do things like yard work and, and different things. We have someone that, that does our yard. We have someone like that, 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 uh, you know, we, we, my kids are not doing the chores that I had to do growing up. Okay. Um, and I didn't have to do horrible chores because my dad grew up in a household that he was made to do a lot of things he never wanted to do. But that's a whole different story. Here's the point of the, that I'm trying to get at. My children have learned their work ethic in a different way. I actually tell my sons all the time, if they want to earn money, I will pay them to read books that I choose for them. Because mm -hmm. what I've learned, if you're struggling in a minimum wage job, the differential between how you get to the next level and where you feel stuck is learning that it's not hard work that's going to get you there. It's actually smart work that's going to get you there. It's understanding how people have done it before you. It's studying. It's not going formally to college. It's learning, reading, think and grow rich. Reading Viktor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning. Reading perspective. What, the, what a lot of people lack is just perspective. When you heard $15,000, you had no perspective of what that $15,000 meant to your grandparents. You only knew the perspective that you sat in. So it's all about the perspective. The other thing that I like to remind people of is my sons are both competitive soccer players. Now they may go <laughs> on to do something different. They may, they may never ever excel in life at that sport, but here's what they do. They work their asses off all the time. They do practice four to five days a week. They train on their own when they want to. Their work ethic will reciprocate in the real world extremely well. Sometimes people have to dip back into who they were and where they came from to remember exactly what makes them great. So I have this conversation. I My executive team at, at my company um, is mostly women. And I love that because the perspective and, and the wisdom that I get from different mindset and, and, and um, you know, our industry is not one that's predominantly uh, anything but men. It's all men and less than 20% women, even less minorities. Here's the interesting point. A lot of times when you're coaching or consulting with uh, women that have been out of the workforce because they've had children – they don't even realize all the great things they've been doing or that they did. And they think they have to start from the bottom again and they lose all that confidence. And so how many athletes are out there that spent 
unbelievable amount of time as a child playing soccer four or five days a week. And now they're working that blue collar job and they can't get ahead. They don't remember surrounding themselves around people that were crushing it in that sport. They don't remember that they were awesome at something. And it came from not only hard work, but learning from the best coaches. Like there are other little tiny factors that if you just plant those seeds with people, it's amazing how it will erupt and grow into something so much more exponential that has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with it. How do you quiet the fear? So the, the fear of making a bad investment, the fear of doing the wrong thing, the fear of, um, and again, not as an advisor, because you're, you're, you're detached, you're professional, you're in all the time, but, but for the clients that you work with, um, uh, you know, the, the, the fear of just, especially when, when it's money, people do not like to lose money, um, but, but they'll sit on the sidelines and they won't invest in that next thing, that next idea, that next passion, that next anything, because just fear stops them. Yeah, fear is universal. Let me tell you this, <laughs> action is the answer to your question. It doesn't matter about mm. my industry. It matters about life. The opposite of sitting in fear is action. When you take steps, even a small step towards it, I told him, I said, buddy, the best thing I could tell you to do is go ride a roller coaster or don't. But when you're ready to face it, you just ride it. And when you ride it, you realize it's all in your brain. Fear is made up of all the things we think about, not the things that are real. People that are most fearful of losing all their money never invest in a way that they could ever lose all their money. (laughs) Right, right. It's like it's it's like the person that's afraid. There, there are watches and there are warnings for weather. Okay, a mm-hmm. tornado watch. It means that you got to be aware. You you just got to have a little radar on to know that it might turn into a warning. A warning means take cover. People actually make every watch a warning, and that's ah. a problem. Action helps you out of that mode. Fear of anything is easily combated with a couple of action steps. I I just did a video on this the other day, and it's so key. I think there's internal and external things that you should be doing. Internally, you have to identify what it is that you're actually scared about. Because guess what? Most of it's complete and utter garbage. You know, worry is praying for what you don't want. It's Dr. Kevin Elko says that. It's one of my favorite quotes. Worry is praying for what you don't want. It's visualizing negative results. Michael Phelps didn't win his like seventh gold medal when his goggles came off by visualizing how bad he was going to finish. He remembered how many strokes it was, how many breaths it was, exactly what the motion was. He visualized success. He didn't spend any time in fear or worry. The more time you spend in fear and worry, the less time you're doing anything worth a damn. So the key is we have to conquer that. And I think this generation of young people coming up is really caught in an anxious moment. They're very, very scared to take that step and break through lies just on the other side of that action step. And you don't know when it happens, but you got to start moving to get there. You just reminded me actually of a lesson that my friend Evan Carmichael uh, taught me three years ago. I was telling him this story about this, this cliff at my cottage. So my cottage where, where I kind of grew up, uh, there was like this 35 foot cliff. And for since like the 1920s, people were throwing themselves off this like 35 foot bluff, we call it. And so, you know, as a young boy, it's like, we're going to the bluff, we're going to the bluff. You know, you're eight, you're 10 years old. So you're standing on the edge and, and you know, the sun is hitting you and it's quiet and the wind is hitting you. And there's nothing within your brain that will tell you to, to, to jump off that cliff. Like there's nothing. And so you can't do it until you back up and you just start running. And you run and you throw yourself off of it. But as soon as you've done it the first time, like the fear is gone. It's, it's gone, completely gone. You get back up there, you do it again and again and again and again, and it's fun. You come back a few weeks, a few months, maybe the next season later, and the fear is there again. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's baked back in there. And so I was telling Evan about this, and he said, Mark, you know, the answer is, the, the, you know what the answer is, right? Always be jumping, right? The, the fear isn't in you, the fear is there when you break it, but then the fear is there when you stop. Always be jumping, don't let the fear come back in. And I said, but I'm just terrified that I'm gonna make this like reckless, catastrophic decision. And to your point, he was like, Mark, there is nothing you can do within yourself to make this reckless, 
catastrophic decision because you worry about it so much. <laughs> like He's like, you're so far away from taking a big risk that will cost you everything. Stop worrying about it. Stop fearing about it. It will never happen. Now, I'd be curious a few years later if maybe I've become, you know, more open to risk and more reckless and and maybe my profile's changed a bit, but uh, you reminded me of that great lesson, which is if you're really worried about it, chances are it's not a real thing because your worry will keep it from becoming a real thing unless your worry somehow manifests that thing, I guess, right? Yeah, well, it takes over. I mean, look, I used this analogy on a podcast I was on a couple of weeks ago and it, it's so true. I remembered in a question that was asked, my sister and I on the jungle gym and I'm probably eight years old. My sister's probably six years old. Maybe I'm six and she's four. I have no idea. But I know that my dad says it's time to go and puts his arms up like this and says, come down. And we were both on the monkey bars and my sister just jumps and she, and he catches her without question. I can't jump to him. I cannot jump to him. I literally have a meltdown and he's arguing with me and he's getting angry and I'm getting frustrated and I'm upset and I'm scared to jump to him. And, you know, it epitomizes a lot of things that I had to work through in my life, which was really a fear of not trusting um, anybody but myself. You know, Mm. I was like, no, 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 I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out, dad. I'll figure it out. Like I should have just jumped to my dad. Logically, my father never would have let me fall. If he did let me fall, he would have fallen first and caught me. There's zero logic to my fear. But but the reality was that was something that that story was probably told like a hundred times after that day. Again, like, remember when you wouldn't jump? Remember, you know, yeah. and it's something that gets embedded in your brain. But the older I got, the more I realized how dumb that was. And there were so many things in our lives that are that simple. But if we just think and write them down, write it down on a piece of paper. I'm scared that I'm going to lose all my money. Why or why not? Pro or con? It is ridiculous what you write in the column of why you're scared of something. It is, you should laugh at yourself when you finish that. And, and I was scared of all the things and so many things um, that action and movement do it. I, and I love this saying, Nike didn't make the tagline. This is a Nike shirt. I don't know where it is there. It doesn't say on, on every Nike shirt, just try it. It's a really crappy tagline. (laughs) So you can't just jump once. You got to keep jumping because it's just do it. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it again and again and again. And the more you do it, the more it becomes something that you now are in control of, not the fear. 